Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I've got some exciting things to talk about today. I'm just going to jump on and share my screen to make sure you can see what I can see. Just there, I better do it the right way. Okay, there we go. Alrighty, thank you so much for joining us, wherever you're coming from in the world. I'm Alex Kearns, and I'm here to talk to you about wildlife photography. I'm going to share a little bit about my wildlife photography journey, a few places I've been, and the expectations versus reality that I had before I went, the expectations, and the reality I was faced with when I got there, and how I had to kind of adjust what I was thinking and doing in order to get the shots I needed. So firstly, I'd like to thank Adorama for having me and Tamron for presenting uh, this webinar today. So I'm going to share a brief intro and some, some stats on uh, my work, my thoughts on wildlife and travel photography, gear I take versus gear I use. I think that's really important to talk about, what we take and what we actually use. And I think this even applies to when we pack to go on trips. How many people pack a whole suitcase of clothes and you end up wearing about four things and 42 things don't even get used? So I'm going to share what I always generally take and then what I always generally use. And then the expectations versus reality I have with wildlife when I'm working with them, tips on how to work on those expectations versus realities, some news, and then I'm going to answer some questions at the end. There's been some questions already submitted and I'll run through those in the chat once I've finished everything else. So firstly, a little bit about me. 30 years ago, I was a police officer. That's me on the bottom left there. At the time, I was the youngest police officer in the state of Western Australia by about a year. And I did that job for 14 years. Then I spent five years doing audit and compliance for counter-terrorist security at airports around Western Australia. So I had a 19 year career of enforcement, compliance, rules, and now I get to be a creative and be an artist, uh, which I think is a, for me, it's a much nicer job. Now, this is what my life looks like. Pretty much playing with puppies all day and going to amazing places like the Antarctic. Now, obviously, running a business and doing this job full time, there's a little bit more to it than that, but I feel very blessed to do what I do. And if animals aren't the absolute best thing to photograph, then I don't even know what is. And I should mention, too, today is World Photography Day. So happy World Photo Photography Day, everyone. And, you know, the world's a big place and it's out there for us to explore with our cameras. So now my life is defined by images. I see images everywhere. I don't always shoot them, but I love that photography gives me open eyes all the time when I'm out and about in the world looking for things to photograph. So this is my last trip to Bali, picture of some geese, a few birds flying around, baby monkey having a drink, and two macaques playing bitey face. That is literally the photo summation of my entire trip to Bali when I went pre-COVID. When my friends say, what about the hotel you stayed in? Did they have a swimming pool? What restaurant did you go to? Where's pictures of you? I'm like, yep, no, here's some geese, a baby monkey having a drink and some monkeys doing bitey face. I literally don't often photograph anything outside the genre of animals. And I'm first and foremost a portrait photographer in relation to animals as well, not necessarily an action, you know, um, in the moment kind of photographer with things that they're doing. This probably photo here is probably about as action as I get. Normally the animals are quite static and I'm trying to grab that nice portrait frame. My stats, a little bit about me. Been a pro photographer now for 13 years. Been shooting since about 2006. My day job is to photograph pets and wildlife, any creatures in a studio. So I do that during the week. And then I get to travel and I photograph wildlife rescue and actual wildlife, rescue wildlife in you know rescue centres and wildlife out you know, in the savannah, uh, using natural light. So two very different types of photography. One's all artificial light in a room and one is just outdoors using natural light. I've been lucky enough to win a few awards. I've got there including an Order of Australia medal. It's kind of similar to the President's Medal uh, in the United States. And I was awarded that for services to charity through photography, which meant a lot to me. And if anything, it made me feel like I had to do more for charity. I do a lot of charity work, but... It made me feel like I had to really earn that medal and do more, more projects to help animals in need. I have seven published books, just signed a contract for number eight last week, which was really exciting. It's out next year. Work with lots of brands, have some global brand deals with greeting card and calendar companies. I've had images print, uh, published in lots of different mediums. 
work with over 40 animal charities on a fairly regular basis. Some of those jobs might be photographing for them, providing sponsorship, providing you know, gift certificates for them to auction, uh, donating them images they can use, helping them print calendars, etc. And I'm an ambassador for a number of brands, including Tamron Lenses, who I've been with now for 10 years. So every photo in this presentation is captured on a Tamron. And what I love about animal photography is the images I take are pretty true to how they were in the camera. There's very minimal editing. Otherwise, you know, the, the donkey doesn't look like a donkey anymore. So I kind of uh, like the authenticity of photographing animals to show you what these lenses can do. This is some of my studio work. I have the pleasure of photographing lots of different animals in the studio, basically anything I can get my hands on. So in this photograph, there's a wombat top left, there's a baby bat, a possum, an owl, and some domestic pets, little dog with a disability, uh, a whole range in there. Dogs are probably my favorite. They're the easiest, but they're also the hardest because they're most aware of their environment and what's going on. I get asked a lot, which is kind of a rather strange question. Why did you choose animals? And I'm like, firstly, why not? Is there even anything else to photograph? The answer is no. No, there is. There's lots of things to photograph, but my absolute favorites, obviously animals, and they chose me. When I got my first entry-level $495 digital SLR camera, I thought, I'm going to photograph everything. It's going to be really easy. I'll just point it at that tractor and that landscape and that plate of food for a still life and that dog and that person, and it'll be great. And I realized fairly quickly for me, it wasn't that great. I struggled with everything other than animals, and I gravitated towards animals if they were around. If I was meant to be doing a portrait shoot and a bird flew past, I'd have more photos of the bird than I would of the family for the portrait shoot when I got home. So I started to listen to that and I thought, well, clearly it's the focus of my lens and maybe I should just follow that. And at the time I was pretty heavily criticized for it. People were saying no one wants photos of animals or their pets. You know, we're talking probably 2009 at this point. And I just thought, well, that's fine, but it's just what I want to do. So I'm kind of glad I was stubborn and I, and I stuck to it. But they definitely chose me. And to this day, like I said, that trip to Bali analogy where, you know, I pretty much only photograph the animals, I still do that to this day. Through my photography, I have two very clear aims. So every photograph I take, I either try to showcase the beauty of animals through that photograph. So I want animals to always be portrayed in a positive light through my work. I think there's enough graphic stuff out there if you want to go and find it. Sometimes you don't even have to go and find it. On social media, it can just pop up in your face. And I feel like for a lot of us who are educated on, you know, animals and how they live and some of their trials and tribulations. We know what animals go through. We know it's not a perfect world for animals quite often. So I want my images to be positive. There's enough of that stuff out there. I don't want people to look at one of my photographs and, you know, not be able to, to see it pretty much. And then from that, wherever I can, I like to support, promote and endorse animal rescue. I've always had this intrinsic belief that because I work with animals, I'm generating an income from mostly domestic pets. Therefore, I should give back to animals. And so the whole charity thing is not something I do from a business perspective. It's obviously done under the banner of my business, but it just comes from this belief that I should help. And, you know, I have quite strong feelings on that. There's lots of ways to give back to lots of different charities. We all have different skill set. We can give skills. You know, we can shake a tin on the corner of a street. If they're doing a fundraiser, we can put a call out if they need blankets. There's lots of things we can do that don't necessarily even cost too much time or money to help animals or anyone in need. So I love to photograph wildlife because I love to travel and I find the freedom of wildlife photography really suits me. You know, in the studio, I have to kind of get the same kind of 30 image set for my clients because they've seen other people's photographs of their pets and they want very similar. So I have to, regardless of that animal's level of training or behaviour, kind of be consistent in the results I get. With wildlife, I just get to grab whatever I like. The animals are just doing whatever they want and I'm picking and choosing. I've been very blessed to have travelled the world through my job, visited all seven continents, led animal photography tours, and I've um, conducted animal charity projects all around the world as well. So there are some rules of wildlife photography that are really important. First one, safety first. You don't want to basically make your photograph, your next photograph, your last photograph. I've got there falling off cliffs. You know, a number of people around the world, even doing selfies, have fallen off cliffs. Now, I can tell you what, that selfie wasn't worth it. It would want to be a pretty good shot if it's going to be your last one that you ever take. So safety first. I'm always super aware of where my feet are. I make sure I wear really good, sturdy shoes, good grip. They're fireproof. They're waterproof. You never know what sort of conditions you're going to be in. I have photographed in bushfires, photographed on rocky cliffs, 
photographed in wet, slippery areas. And I, and because I'm around animals, I want to make sure I've always got a great exit plan as well if I need to get out of there really quickly. So I've got to have good footwear, good footwear, and not be too caught up in what I'm looking at down the bar of the lens that I'm not aware peripherally what's coming up. You know, when you're shooting, you don't have any peripheral vision, can't see what's coming up here. So you have to kind of always be aware of your surroundings. You know, uh, I photograph on an island off the coast of the city I live in called Rottnest Island. And quite often in September when I go there, there are tiger snakes on the island, which are highly venomous. And when you're sitting, if you're not paying attention, you're photographing birds or quokkas, which are small marsupials that live on the island, one of those snakes can be right next to you. Put your hand down to get up. Uh, and if you don't look, you're in a lot of trouble. So you want to make sure safety first always. Read your subject's body language. Most animals, even the most wild wildlife, will give you a warning before it acts in an aggressive manner or acts out at you. Very rarely do animals just lash out. They will normally give you, it may just be a, a sideways look. It might be a posturing in their body. It might be a tensening of their muscles. Uh, you know, um, the intensity of their stare. There's lots of different things animals would do. And if you get that feeling of, oh, I think they're looking at me a bit strange, get out of there if you can. Acknowledge it because they probably are. Trust your instincts. You know, if it doesn't feel right, you're like, I think that lion just looked at me twice. Don't let it look at you a third time. <laughs> so, you know, you always want to be um, aware of what they're doing and what mood they're in and their body will give that away generally nine times out of ten. Very, very rarely do they just go for you. Animals don't sit still. Kind of what I love about them, they're a little bit out of control, <laughs> especially wildlife that's just out there being wild. And they don't pose. You know, you'd be like, you know, to the elephant, you know, 100 yards away, could you please look this way? The elephant's like, no, I can't. You know, you have to work around what they're doing. And I love the challenge of that. The studio shoots that I do, I have a bit of control. The dog is fairly, or the cat, whoever it is, fairly close to me. I have toys and treats. I can generally, you know, get them still for a split second that I need to get that shot, give them a food reward. With wildlife, I don't have any of those means. It's just whatever is presented to me. And we have to look for moments. That's our job. Watch, watch the scene, watch what's happening and grab those moments that look like photographs that could make a good result. And the beauty of digital. I am all for using and abusing the capacity of digital cameras. We have memory cards. I think I've got some one terabyte memory cards I'm using at the moment. I fully use and abuse those cards and take lots of shots. When I'm at a scene uh, photographing, say it's a zebra, I will photograph the whole zebra, the zebra with the zebra next to it, the pattern of the zebra, the feet, the eye, the face, the ears, every single bit of that zebra I can for as long as it's there so that when I walk away, I don't get back to you know my hotel room or my office and go, damn, I forgot to get the whole body shot or oh, I should have gone, you know, for the eye photo. Try and cover off on everything while I'm there. And I take each of those pictures multiple times, you know, to make, you know, if we even breathe sometimes, you know, that can, you know, play havoc with your focus. If there's dust in between you and your subject, there's, you know, there's lots of factors that can impact. If the zebra is moving, you know, every shot is slightly different. So, you know, it's not unusual for me on a, like a wildlife tour or safari, I'd easily shoot 5,000 photos a day. And I think uh, just got back literally a week and a half ago from Tanzania, spent two weeks in Tanzania and took about 20,000 photos on the days that I was uh, sh across the days I was shooting, um, maybe even a few more. And probably from that pulled out, <coughs> excuse me, that's Tanzania dust. I ate a lot of it. So it's in my lungs. Uh, when I got back, I probably pulled out about maybe 15 to 20 photos that I showed people out of 20,000. I'm really particular about what I keep. I've still got all the other photos and they're fine, but I'll pick from each of those series of shots that I did what I think is the absolute best photograph out of all of them. And you've got to critique your own work. Self-auditing is a really good skill to have. So looking at a photograph and going, oh, it's, you know, it's only 80% sharp. Mm, is it enough to get away with? Or, oh, the colour's all wrong. Can I fix it? No, but I really like the expression. Yeah, but it's, you know, got this pink colour tone that I can't get off in Photoshop. You know, you want to make sure you're looking at your work with a critical eye, but they're not being too critical when nothing is good enough. I pick 20 photos because I feel that I might have photographed 20 animals that day and, uh, you know, that, that course of that trip, and I feel like they're the absolute best. And as a professional, I have a, a standard that I set for myself. People on the tour, on the other hand, in the private group we have, I show them more photos because I'm less fussy about what they see because they were there in the moment. 
But on my professional pages, you know, I pick out the absolute cream of the crop and anything that's just a bit funny but doesn't quite make the technical perfection that I require doesn't get seen. So self-auditing is a good tool to have, but probably like me, a lot of us as photographers are perfectionists and we have to know when to stop, when to stop with editing, when to say, when it is good enough. You know, that's really important too. Don't be too hard on yourself. And even with that, I think the best bit of advice I can give is if you love the photograph, that is all that matters. I've got some pictures that are really abstract. They're of random things like lakes with some tree reflections on them that I don't even normally photograph, which is probably why I like them, why they appeal to my sense of, you know, creativity. And I show people and they're like, that's not, no, that's terrible. It's not even good. I love it because it's abstract and it's artistic and I was there and I know how I felt when I took it. So it's really important to just know that if you love it, that is more than enough. Why do we take photographs? We want to preserve a memory for ourselves or for other people. And we want to share experiences, events and places. You know, no photographer ever has gone, looked at the back of their camera and gone, wow, this is the best photo I've ever taken. And when the person next to them has said, oh, can I see it? They've gone, no, I'm not going to show anyone ever. It's just for me. You know, we love to share this stuff. I get to show you how I see animals through my own eyes by using my camera. And I find that just to be the most incredible magic ever that, you know, I can show you how I see dogs, happy, colourful, bright, friendly, elephants, zebras, you know, penguins, whatever it is, through my images, you will see how I see animals. And same for you when I look at your photographs. So it's all about sharing, connecting to people, connecting to the world and preserving those memories. And then why do we travel? You know, you don't have to travel far. Sometimes I travel to my backyard and there's birds out there, you know, but we have that sense of wanderlust. We want to go and, you know, a lot of, I guess, good photos come from having access to these creatures. You, know, you just have to be there. And sometimes there's so many animals that you sport for choice for getting a good shot. We want to seek adventure and we want to take photos. We want to photograph and document where we've been. And again, show people how we see these locations and these animals in these locations through the lenses of our cameras. Firstly, though, we need gear. Can't take photos if we don't have gear. So I'm currently using a Canon 1DX Mark II body and a Sony A1. Now I used to use the Canon for everything, uh, studio uh, portraits and my wildlife stuff. Just recently, I've kind of uh, kept it in the studio and I mostly use a Sony A1 now for all my travel. So some of these tours were that I'm going to show you in a second, some of these locations, I'm going to talk about the expectations versus reality. I was shooting with the Canon and the very last one, Africa, I was shooting with the Sony A1. So I have a full suite of lenses for Tamron lenses for my Canon camera body. Uh, this, these are some of my favourites. Um, I really like zooms for wildlife work. Mostly, so you'll notice there, apart from a 90mm macro lens, everything else has a zoom capacity because that can give me the opportunity to pick and choose which subject I want and keep me a safe distance away. I prefer that to primes for what I do. Uh, even on my Africa tour, uh, someone had a 400mm lens, which they loved, but at times I had limitations because, you know, the focal distance to focus on the animal was quite uh, a distance away, whereas the shorter zooms like, you know, 150 to 600 mill lens, the animal didn't have to be too far away for me to be able to zoom in on it. And I could pick and choose where I shot on that lens. You know, if I wanted a full face shot or a body shot, I was able to do that. Tamron also have E-mount lenses for Sony. So these are the lenses I mostly use on my A1 camera. And again, big massive zoom there, all zooms. You know, the 28 to 75 is more a portrait lens. The 70 to 180 is good for kind of moderate uh, wildlife work. I'd probably maybe use that for birds in flights, f2.8, so it's super fast. And the 28 to 200 mil, um, also quite fast uh, at the 28 end. Um, also probably good for birds in flight as well. And then the big zoom, good for everything. So my settings when I'm photographing wildlife, I shoot on A mode for the Sony or the AV mode on Canon. It's the same for Nikon cameras as well. And I generally use, these are not my hard and fast rules, but I generally use the lowest f-stop number on the lens. So if it's 2.8, I use it at 2.8. If it goes from f5 to f6.3 as I zoom, I use f5. Then when I zoom, I use f6.3. I try and use the lowest number on that lens because that makes the lens the fastest. And I only adjust my ISO up and down because on A or AV mode, the camera does the shutter speed for me. And now lately, I've even been using auto ISO sometimes. Now, again, I'm photographing portraits. If I was doing action, I might need to use higher ISOs to make the camera faster, to make the shutter speed faster or I may even need to use one of the other settings, even a manual mode, and set my shutter speed quite fast to make sure I'm freezing that action. 
Uh, I thought, you know, auto ISO was a bit of a no-no for a professional till I spoke to some of my professional friends and they're like, we've been using it for years. So don't ever let anyone tell you, unless you're using full manual, you're not a proper photographer. You know, I am well and truly a proper photographer and yet I, I drop into manual now and then, but I mostly use AI AV mode. I'm kind of a creature of habit. And sometimes I adjust my exposure compensation. That's the little slider where you can make your, your scene darker or lighter. So if I'm, you know, finding that my other settings are good, I'm, I'm getting a sharp shot, but it's still a bit dark or a bit bright, I can use that exposure meter to adjust that. Despite your research, wildlife photography can be an unpredictable mix of expectations versus reality. You can research a location as much as you want until you actually get there, there's always a bit of a surprise. And I've just been to Tanzania for the second time and I had a lot of surprises even based on the first time I went. It was different. Things change all the time because wildlife is moving, it's fluid, you know, it's always different. Animals react differently as things change. Animals, you know, having a good day, a bad day, lots of stuff is changing. There's lots of moving parts. So first up, let's start with the Antarctic. I went there on a tour, I led a photo tour there several years ago, and I went to photograph wildlife. Great, nice, sounds like a nice, uh, easy trip. I took these three lenses with me. I thought, right, I'll need a portrait lens for all the icebergs I'm going to photograph. 72 to 100 mil for all the you know, really close penguins. And then I'll take the big zoom and I'll probably use that the least because it's, you know, it might be too big. And, you know, I've got the 70 to 200 for the close stuff. The actual uh, truth of it was I mostly used the big zoom. I didn't even use the other two lenses at all. This zoom lens enabled me to pick and choose uh, my subjects really well, especially when you land on the Antarctic continent. And there's 5,000 pairs of breeding penguins there. What do you even point at? This enabled me to pick faces or bits or body parts out of that scene. So my expectations before I went, did a lot of research, talked to people who'd been, I thought that the animals would be really close and they'd be friendly. I thought my batteries might drain fairly quickly. I went in late January, early February, and I thought there'll be lots of photographic opportunities from the ship. There'll be really close whales, lots of birds. Again, everything in that aspect is kind of moving if you're on the ship, because the ship's moving. I thought that'll be easy. Just go out onto the deck and I'll get some shots. The reality was it was very bright and sunny. Now, I thought the Antarctic would be grey. It was quite bright. I suffered from uh, almost too much choice at times. There were too many creatures to photograph, and I didn't know which one to pick. There was the overstimulation of senses. There was so much going on. One day I'm on the Antarctic continent for the first time, 5,000 pairs of breeding penguins. It's lightly snowing. Now, in Australia, where I am, we don't have snow at all. In our summers are 110 degrees. 40 odd degrees Celsius, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't have a lot of, you know, we have cold days, but not snow. And so I'm standing there, it's snowing, there's penguins everywhere. I can see our ship and there's a, a glacier off to the left. And I was just like, this is like a different planet. Um, we we're photographing from the Zodiac a lot more than I realized. So yes, some photography from the ship, but mostly on the Zodiac. And I needed waterproof gloves. And I think there was a question already in the chat, uh, some Questions were pre-sent in. Someone said, "What do you? What sort of you know hand gear do you wear in the Antarctic? Mittens or gloves? Don't wear anything wool or anything that can get heavy and cold when wet. We were putting our hands in that water and pulling out little bits of iceberg and you know um, little chunks of ice and looking at you know plankton and things that were trapped in there for thousands of years, basically. So you want really good gloves. Now I had gloves that weren't waterproof, so they were very impractical and had very cold hands." So excuse the graphic nature of this photo. This is day three in the Antarctic. And the first day of our Antarctic trip, unfortunately, one of the elderly ladies had her hand in the bathroom steel door frame. And as the boat lurched, the steel door slammed shut and it severed her thumb. She was fine, as fine as you can be with a severed thumb, but we had to offload her. So we went to uh, some military bases um, near the the South Shetland Islands, and we had to wait there for two days until the weather cleared for the medivac plane to land to be able to offload her onto the plane. And in that time, we couldn't leave the ship. Now, this trip went for 12 days. I've got 20 people on the, they're travelling with me. There was probably 80 people on the trip altogether. I'm a little bit worried because I'm thinking these people spent a lot of money to come with me and photograph wildlife, and here we are stuck on the ship for three days. Uh, you know, But we have to do what's best for the welfare of the passenger. So finally, the, the weather cleared, the plane could land, and off she went. So they quickly threw us in some Zodiacs and they took us to the shore and it was a big kind of glacier we walked up and got to the top and you can see the snow's fairly melted up here, but it was very sunny and penguins being black and white, the blacks were kind of either too dark or the whites were too bright. I was having trouble getting that exposure right. 
because it was so bright. The ground was white, bright. The sky was white, bright. Penguin was white and black. And so I got this photo of a penguin pooping and everyone was laughing and saying to me, look, if the weather turns, you know, or it stays, it gets too hectic and we can't go out again because there were a few rough days in there too where, you know, we wouldn't have been able to go out even if we'd been, um, you know, sailing and not stuck at the shore. They're like, you know, or if it's too sunny in the future, this might be the only photo you get. So I was worried that for the first few days of my Antarctic trip, this is what I was going to come home with. Um, thankfully, it wasn't all I got. But this is kind of what you're presented with when you land on the Antarctic continent. There is so much going on here. This time's 5,000. All those little blobs laying on the ground, they're the babies, they're the chicks. Uh, they're all fluffy. There are penguins stealing rocks, penguins moving things around, babies running and falling over, skewers, which are kind of not seagull-like birds, but they're carnivorous birds that are trying to steal chicks and eat them. They're flying around trying to hover over chicks to grab them. You know, adults showing them away, adult penguins running in. It's a lot. So what do you focus on? And that's why that big zoom was perfect. I could pick a face out in front like this, and that's just the, the sky background in the background. Uh, or I could go and choose, you know, also the whole scene. I was able to zoom in and just pick out bits like it doesn't look cold, but it was freezing. And these feet on that cold, icy rock, uh, you know, I was just able to zoom in and pick out bits of these penguins. Um, this little chick, we went to the post office. There's a post office in the Antarctic. Yeah, and basically there's a four or five, I think, volunteers that work there for a few months at a time from all around the world. And it's just on a little isolated section of the Antarctic. You motor up in your ship. Everyone goes to the post office. There's a small museum there. And you can post a postcard, which I did. And it, I still haven't got it. So it's been about seven years. Uh, so I don't know how effective the post office is. Some people got theirs. I didn't get mine. I'm still bitter because I'm still talking about it. Uh, but anyway, I posted the postcard and then I just got out of there because I wanted to go and photograph outside. I didn't really want to do the museum or the ground in the post office. And I was laying on the boardwalk amongst a heap of, of, you know, penguin poop. And I remember someone from the ship, one of the staff saying, who's laying down there in all the poop? And someone went, oh, yeah, that's just Alex. Oh, yeah, of course, that's her job <laughs> She's down there. And I was photographing this little penguin chick. So that top bit of white feathers is the mother. The little grey bit to the right is the butt of the sibling. And the little penguin chick was just stuck in there. So things like that that I could just isolate, you know, with that lens. Little chicks running around, just running around screaming because they can, falling over, being babies. And this was a, quite a blizzardy day. So that blurry kind of line along the bottom of that penguin laying there, you can see it's all fuzzy because it was all snow kicking up. And we just literally heard this insane noise and looked to our left and an iceberg rolled, which was phenomenal to see this massive iceberg just flipped over. And meanwhile, this guy's just laying there out in the open in the, the blizzard. And we were standing there photographing. Um, so I love this shot. He's got all bits of um, ice hitting his face, you know, coming through his face as well. But again, that lens enabled me to do that. Had my lens hood on to make sure I wasn't getting too much spray on my actual camera lens. Um, so the lens hood kind of protected it a little bit, but it got to a point where we couldn't shoot anymore. It was just too hectic. And again, just zooming in and picking out scenes. Now I've cropped that, that wing of that penguin quite tight there. There might've been someone else photobombing and sitting there that I didn't want in the shot, just using the rocks as the foreground. And again, the white sky as the background. And the babies, they're all dirty because they're sliding around on the ground all the time for fun so they get filthy they're all a little bit brown you'll notice um this one too filthy dirty is from playing in the dirt and the result excuse me the resolution on this shot's not great because i think it's a low res but a few years ago before i went to the antarctic i remember judging quite a prestigious australian photography competition and there was a photo very similar to this where a penguin had a rock in its beak and i remember thinking wow they went to all the effort to go to the antarctic they, so time and money, it's a hectic trip to get there, especially from Australia. And they found a penguin with a rock in its beak and they got an amazing shot with a nice clear sky background. Like that's phenomenal. And when I landed on the Antarctic continent, not to take anything away from that shot, uh, I stepped out and there were the 5,000 penguins and, you know, a good percentage of them had rocks in their beaks. So I realised it was just a situational photograph. It's one of those photos that most of us could possibly get in some way, shape or form if we're just sitting there in front of those penguins. And basically what they do is they build rock nests and they steal rocks from other nests. So when that one, that penguin's not looking, they take their rock and carry it and put it over there. So it's basically theft in action. On to Cambodia and Vietnam. I went there a few years ago to photograph rescued captive wildlife, namely rescue sun and moon bears. They have mostly uh, moon bears. So they're going to be captive in cages. I took these two lenses. I thought, right, I'll take a portrait lens because, you know, 
their bears in captivity. They'll probably, you know, be quite close to the fence, be pretty easy to shoot through wire, etc. And I took my medium sized zoom. And I only ended up using my zoom. Yet again, the biggest lens I had was the one I used, uh, the biggest one I took. So my expectations, I thought I have decent access. They're captive. Now, this rescue centre had been taken over by the bear rescue charity, Free the Bears, uh, only recently before I'd been there. So it's pretty rudimentary. It's pretty basic. It's now been improved a lot. They were, you know, working as hard as they could to improve it. But it was at this point, it was pretty basic. They had a couple of big exercise yards for the bears and the bears would be in their dens and then they'd put them out in certain groups that got along into the exercise yards and put them back in the dens and they'd sleep. So they're mostly outdoors during the day. And I thought I'd be, I thought they'd be mostly outdoors. And now I thought I'd be safe because there'd be barriers, they'd be in enclosures. You know, at sanctuaries, there's normally a red line on the painted on the you know, pavement. You don't go past that line or they can reach you through the bars, etc. The reality was they were often in their den. So they'd come out for their playtime and go back in the den. And they'd have to alternate these, I think they had 35 bears and maybe two or three play areas. They'd only put five or six out at a time. So they had to rotate them through. I was shooting through more fencing and bars than I realised. You know, I thought I'd have good high vantage points that I could shoot from. Um, there are electric fences. They had longer reach than I realised. Um, I was filming with a GoPro and one of them actually grabbed it and was pulling it towards his mouth. And I actually had to put my hand on his claw and pull it out because they eat stuff. And I'd just been told that one had eaten something, you know, not, not long before and had to have surgery to have it removed. And I did not want to be responsible for, you know, a bear getting sick or having to have surgery because I ate a GoPro camera. Um, you have to manage your own safety. Quite often when I go to places, you know, as the photographer, they assume I know everything about all animals, and I don't. You know, sometimes I learn it on the job. And I try and do my research because safety is important, but, you know, I can't know everything. So they'll just be like, oh, yeah, you go photograph the bears. I'm like, what, what are the rules? There were leeches and ticks everywhere, leeches particularly in the grasses we were walking around. It was quite wet and squishy. And there was some bonus wildlife that I didn't expect to be there. There were some actual um, monkeys bombing around the sanctuary as well. So this is what I was kind of presented with when I went to photograph. I was like, oh, this is great. Like, I can't even see them. There's probably one, two, there's about seven bears in that photo. You can't even tell because they're just blobs under bushes. Um, and then we threw in some treat balls. They're like big treat balls you have for your dogs. They're actually uh, bit made by an Australian company called Aussie Dog, and they're extended versions of the small balls you have for your dogs to keep them entertained. So in there is honey, straw, nut seeds, and they tip it around and they get out the prize, basically. Uh, but even then, like, I can't really get a clear shot of any of these bears from where I'm standing there. And I'm up on a slightly raised platform. You can tell by the elevation and the angle. No, no one is presenting their face. You know, but I definitely need that zoom lens. And blurry photo, but this is just what the fences were like. They were those kind of mesh fences. It's got a little sign saying there it's electric. We always had to ask, is the fence on? Um, the outside fence wouldn't zap you, but the in, there's inside wires that would uh, zap you and then sometimes the bears were kicking off now in this case I'd walked into an empty I was escorted thankfully but into an empty enclosure and it had very thin strands of wire like knee height chest height or stomach height and chest height so gaps like this much between them just three very thin strands of wire of electric fence and then that was the next enclosure these guys were right there and they're having a fight uh, and I'm thinking oh my goodness if they just tumbled they would just fall through those three strands of wire straight onto me um, another problem was because I was looking at them and I was walking, I stopped and one strand of wire, the fence was right here. I couldn't see it because I was looking through to like the jungle area. It, it would have knocked me off my feet right on the face, which would have been very not fun. So dangerous. Like These guys are kicking off and having a big punch up. And I'm like, guys, you've been through enough. You've already been rescued. How about just, you know, peace and love? And they're like, no, we have to fight. Now they don't, um, this is a lot of posturing and show. They don't hurt each other, but it is pretty scary when you see it. Um, you know, it's probably over someone stole someone's apple and someone else told them off, you know, because just like kids, basically. Uh, and then down, this photo was actually shot through wire. There's a little bit of wire evidence on the left-hand side, but they were quite down low, you know, not a lot of light in their eyes. The photo is very dark. Um, you know, it's kind of flat looking, uh, eating a watermelon. They gave me some food thinking it would help, but it didn't really help either. So I just had to work with what I could. I shot this photo of these little bears in a den through some wire. And I put that 70 to 200 mil lens against the wire and I made sure it was in the center so I didn't have bits of wire coming through it and I started shooting. Uh, this shot, this little guy, they'd never had treat balls before these bears because, um, and by the way, they were sun bears there, these fairy guys and moon bears. Um, these guys had never had enrichment 
when the other organization ran the rescue. So we, we, our actual tour group took these treat balls over with us in our in our excess baggage on the plane. And this is the first time this bear had been given a treat ball and she's basically looking into it to see if there's any more treats in there. And in the end, she went and got all the treat balls that we'd given to all the bears that were playing in the pool. There's about six treat balls and put them all in the pool and was like smashing them up and down and having the best time. The joy that she expressed was amazing to see. Now, for this photo, I'm at the, the gate, and you know the gate, you put your hand through and you pulled the bolt to unlock the gate. It had a, a bit of a stronger kind of locking thing than that, but basically I'm shooting through the little gate mechanism where you put your hand through to undo the padlock, and you know if you open it, the bears can run out. So that's where I was shooting to get that shot. And then I just used the bars. I went with what I had. Now, this has all changed, thankfully, now since um, they've renovated the sanctuary and I had a bit more time to invest in it. But... You know, these are a different type of photo. Look at that bed. It's like just bare metal, like something from the 1800s. You know, the bears now have hammocks and they have straw in them and they, you know, have, um, you know, comfort. But this place was pretty basic. Um, you know, just laying in the bed when they're not playing outside. Very different now. And this, but this is sort of picture that begs for a quote. I actually did have a quote on a photo like this, you know, just talking about their eyes are the windows to the soul. Or when you look into an animal's eyes, what you see and feel. You know, and that's kind of great for a fundraising message or, you know, you know to help the bears. You know, they really needed to get out of these conditions, and they did fairly quickly, thankfully. And then this little guy, again, uh, he, I was in the quarantine area, and I couldn't go too close to the bears because it's quarantine, and they brought out one of the little baby sun bear cubs, and there was a white pillar there on the right-hand side, and she was just peering out from it. Because I had a long enough lens, I could get a shot like this without being anywhere near her. Um, and she was super cheeky, and that was like a game she was playing with me where I kind of had to time it to grab the photo every time she popped out. And then, as I mentioned, random bonus wildlife. There were some macaques bombing around. There were some gibbons there as well that I think had been rescued and released and had had a baby, and these animals were just, you know, in those areas as well, running around. In, uh, this, this one was in Cambodia. You know, wildlife. So I'm in a rescue centre, but there is wildlife attracted to the centre because they know that within the boundary of that fence they won't be poached or hunted or harmed. And quite often they come there too to seek out food. Sri Lanka, a few years ago I went to Sri Lanka, led a photo tour, just went to photograph wildlife. Now I didn't know a lot about Sri Lanka. Uh, I thought I might be lucky if I see a few elephants and some birds. It is phenomenal. It probably for me, as far as elephant content goes and birds, if you're into birds, rivals Africa. Mornings are awesome for birds, afternoons awesome for elephants. Remember I said to my guide, how many elephants will we see today? He said, I don't know, 100. And I thought, well, that's a massive exaggeration. And we literally saw 100 elephants. <laughs> that's really cool. So I took everything. I better take everything. Going to see all the things. I need stuff for elephants, the birds, to, you know, whatever else pops up. There might be some lizards, a butterfly or something. Took everything. And in this case, I used the big zoom again and the macro and didn't even take the other two lenses out of the bag. My expectations, there'll be wide open planes and we'll be photographing from a Jeep mostly. So it'll be in the safety of the vehicle and there'll be lots of unobstructed views. The reality was some of the animals were very dangerous. Um, one of the elephants in particular at the park had a head injury from years before and would just charge vehicles without provocation no matter how far away you were. And she actually got pretty close to one of our vehicles and was trying to pull out uh, people on my tour by the arm uh, using her trunk. Um, thankfully, she didn't get anyone out of the car, but it was pretty scary. Um, and no matter how many times we drove way, way away from her, she'd just keep running at us in the end. We just had to go miles away from where she was. Again, you need to ma manage your safe proximity. Sometimes when you're in a vehicle kind of safari, drivers want to get you, especially when you're photographing, the best access. And the best access isn't on top of something. Firstly, because you're too close to take the shot. Secondly, it can cause animal stress. And thirdly, it's dangerous. You don't have to park right beside the elephant. And so um, first thing I do when I do a tour is I educate my drivers about distances of lenses because that kind of covers off on the other things. You know, I'm like, we don't need to be too close because also we don't want to get grabbed out of the Jeep by the arm by an elephant. Um, some of the animals are really fast. Elephants move a lot faster than I ever imagined. You know, how can you not get something that's weighs several ton in sharp focus? Well, if they're running at full speed, it can be quite difficult. Um, the terrain was very rough. We were trying to photograph at times because we just were driving from A to B and not stopping and bouncing around in Jeeps. Um, there's a bit of a language barrier with our drivers, so lack of communication. We, in the end, developed a system where if we banged on the roof, they stopped because they were in a cabin and we're in the back, so we didn't have that direct line of communication with them. And there was a lot of urban wildlife. Um, even around the hotels, there were troops of monkeys, squirrels, lizards, and we even saw, you know, some captive elephants, which people were like, oh, I don't like that, don't actually want to take a photo. 
you know, elephants that were enslaved um, being used to work. But out on the plains, there were fairly open plains that uh, rang true. There was a lot more forest than I thought. And one of the scary things is literally an elephant can just walk a minute into the forest and disappear completely, yet it's right there. You know, how can this thing camouflage so well? But they do. Um, little baby elephants were playing. There's lots of babies around. Baby elephants, one of the cutest things. Very protected by the herd, but absolutely adorable. I was able to use my Zoom. We were, you know, didn't have to be on top of this elephant to get this shot. So I actually, actually, I think to fit this in, this was at uh, 150 mil of that 150 to 600 mil lens. And I was actually saying to driver, can you go back? Because I, you know, we we're too close. I couldn't get enough. Um, you know, I was getting too zoomed in. I needed to pull back within the vehicle so I could fit the whole elephant in as much as it was, as much as I wanted to in that shot. Uh, Kingfish is this taken from a boat. We did a little boat cruise. Uh, again, pretty hard conditions because on the boat it's not that stable. But the bird was nice and still, so I was able to get a sharp shot. And in the mornings, the bird activity was just off the charts. Like I mentioned. Um, it was excellent. Some people sometimes on tours get a bit tired. They don't want to come out every day. Uh, some people slept in in the mornings. We would, you know, get up at five o'clock, get up there for sunrise and just see the most amazing bird action. And there were lots of urban wildlife. There were lots of crows around. I was quite obsessed with these because I actually love, cr love crows and ravens. They're one of my favourite birds. And they were everywhere, all over Colombo, the capital. These birds were everywhere. And so we're at the beach and there's no seagulls. There's just these black raven type birds. So that's what I photographed. You know, if that's what's there, that is what I'll shoot. It doesn't have to be something glamorous and exotic for me to still get joy from photographing it. I love this shot. You can actually see the beach reflected in the bird's eye. Um, you know, so we're at the, the beach that day and there's just crows on ravens on signs, on boats, you know, running around on the sand. And like I mentioned, urban wildlife at the hotels, squirrels. And this was right under this squirrel, uh, little tiny squirrel where people were having lunch and just running around the tree above them. And again, being from Australia, we don't have squirrels. So any of you that are from the States or countries that have squirrels, you can spot a tourist because they'll be freaking out over the squirrel. Uh, nine times out of ten, it's probably uh, a photographer and it might even be me. And then while we're in the Jeep, what, what's one of the creatures I'm absolutely obsessed with? And I've been to Tanzania twice now and the whole time I've said, please just find me a dung beetle. Apparently they're everywhere, but they're everywhere certain times of the year. And both times when I've been, June a few years ago and July, August just now is not the time. I just want to see dung beetles. I think they're fascinating. Anyway, in, in Sri, Sri Lanka, we look out down from the Jeep onto the road and there's a dung beetle rolling a ball of poop away to its house. And it was moving so quickly. Like you can see how fast its legs are moving. This whole shot is blurry. But I was like, oh, no, that's a special panning technique, you know, because I, I actually love this shot because it's just the thing was so frantic. And while this is happening, I look out and I see a sloth bear so kind of like it looks a bit like a moon bear, big shaggy bear. And I've worked with sloth bears quite a bit in India at a bear rescue sanctuary. And I saw wild sloth bear. And I clearly pointed my camera up. And as it was running through the bush, I was kind of trying to track it. And I got this shot, which again, is all scratchy. And it's, you know, it looks like there's lots of motion. And so I uh, posted these two shots on social media and said, this is special technique, <laughs> special panning, you know, scratchy technique. Everyone loves them. Um, you know, I don't know if either of them are that great as far as photos go, but memory-wise, like this was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And that to see a sloth bear in the wild when all I've ever seen is them in captivity, um, bears that had been used, um, you know, taken as cubs and used to made to dance for tourists, then were rescued in India. They're the bears I was working with. To see one running free through the bush, you know, the forest was amazing. And we went to a turtle rescue centre and ironically it was the Hasselblad Turtle Rescue Centre Hasselblad had started this turtle rescue centre X number of years ago and basically they take the little turtles, um, they dig out the eggs, put them in incubators and they hatch the turtles and they, they release the little baby turtles when their belly buttons have closed over. Because their belly buttons are open, they kind of ooze a little bit of blood when they're small and they get eaten because fish are attracted to that. So I think it's that maybe three days to a week. I uh, might need a fact check on that, but basically they get released back into the ocean um, and then they're all, their tummy's all healed and they, they have a better chance of survival. So these little turtles are about this big, tiny. And um, this is where I was using the macro lens because they're basically in a big tank. They're all floating around. There's hundreds of turtles floating around this tank. And I was just trying to isolate a few of them together. And then I saw a dragonfly. I was um, walking around the edge of the swimming pool and I didn't have, I think I had shorts on and a T-shirt and a hat. And I saw a dragonfly land on the white kind of, 
beige tiles of the pool. Now, I have um, mirror image this photo too. So this is, you know, the maximum kind of editing I do, mainly because one of the front legs was a bit wonky and one of the wings to one side was a bit damaged. So I've mirror imaged this picture. But I saw this uh, in the pool, on the you know, edge of the pool, a swimming pool, and I thought, I need a photo of that. So I jumped in with my clothes on with my camera. And this is the shot of me and my friend Kath trying to photograph. I've got the hat on back to front. The little tiny dragonflies, that little thing on that white strip in front of us. And that's my other friend Kelly saying, these guys are crazy, <laughs> you know. But when people saw this shot, everyone wished they'd jumped in the pool with their clothes on. <laughs> and all I was doing is saying, please don't do a big bomby into the pool right now because I've got my camera here with my macro lens on it. You can see how close I am to that dragonfly. Kath's probably got a portrait lens on hers. She's a bit further back. And then because I had the macro, we stayed at this beautiful garden and I got some nice flower shots, probably one of the few flower shots I've ever taken. I don't do very many, um, but I was able to use the macro. This is some sort of, sort of sunflowery kind of plant it was. Went to the Galapagos Islands, to, again, just on a tour to photograph wildlife. And I took everything because that's what I do. Let's take all the things. I'm starting to learn, you know, how to cull these lenses a little bit, but you can see the pattern. Guess which lens I used? This one, I didn't even take the other ones out of my camera bag. I used the big zoom. Now, my expectations when I went there, everything will be close and friendly. It's like the Antarctic. Uh, we'll be photographing from our boat a lot, and there'll be lots of white sandy beaches because it's the Galapagos. You know, it's going to be lovely, just white beaches and friendly animals. And I realised in reality, the animals were even closer than I imagined, way closer. We saw lots of unexpected creatures that I didn't even, you know, think I'd come across, uh, flamingos and um, we went swimming and iguanas were swimming with us and diving under us and it was just crazy. Lots of big turtles. There were different beaches, uh, three different beach colours, white, red and black, and so not just white pristine ones. Every morning I loved getting up because every night, every, you know, the ocean, the tide would come in and everything would be washed fresh and it was all quite bright. There was an amazing underwater world that I didn't plan for, didn't have any sort of underwater camera at all, um, and it pays not to always listen to your guide. Yes, if it's safety, but not if it's about taking photos or not taking photos. So there were these um, really pretty crabs. I think they're called Sally Ann crabs, really pretty, vibrant crabs. Now, normally I'm not that interested in crabs, but they were quite fascinating. Amazing frigate birds blowing out the big um, bag that they have on their chest. Um, background is just, you know, brown kind of sky there. Flamingo just walked past. We were photographing iguanas swimming in this little lake uh, on a sand dune behind the beach randomly, and a flamingo just walked in. And I remember there was another photo I had that was a bit blurry, so I didn't include it, but it was a little, one of the iguanas was swimming past at one point, and I just thought, this is just crazy. Where would I ever be in the world where I'm watching a lizard swim past a flamingo who just turned up from nowhere walking through a lake at the beach? It was just, it was amazing. On our boat one day, walked out on the ship, and a frigate bird landed on the navigation equipment. So because I had that big zoom, I'm literally standing just, you know, yards away from it and could photograph straight up as the wind was blowing its feathers. And the creatures being close, marine iguanas, they were just everywhere. Amazing. They're like little prehistoric dinosaurs. To get this shot, there were masses of iguanas around. We saw hundreds, probably thousands. They're all laying on each other. And this was pre-COVID. And all they do is sit there and they just sneeze on each other. Like they're probably still doing it. That stuff doesn't go down in this day and age, you know, in the current world. Can't do that, but no one's told them. So they're probably there still now sneezing on each other. And I laid down on the ground. I had to be very careful at this place because I don't know if you guys have seen that documentary from the BBC about the snakes dropping literally from the rocks and chasing the lizards in the Galapagos. Well, we were on the back of that island. So the snakes were around the other side, but there were snakes kind of everywhere in the crevasses and things. So laying down on the ground, you had to, again, like I mentioned with the tiger snake, be aware of your surroundings. And I just shot up into the sky to get this amazing armoured face. It looks like a warrior, you know, about to go to war. His uh, weapon is his sneeze. And then one of the red sandy beaches, uh, they, they have really good wildlife restriction laws in the Galapagos. You've got to be a certain distance away from all the animals at all times. Animals can walk up to you, but you have to move away if you can or just keep moving. And this is one of the red beaches, which was just fascinating to see this pinky kind of red sand. And I was a fair distance away from this seal. Well, it's the legal distance away that we could go. Seals can move pretty fast and they can bite like a dog. Uh, so you don't want to get bitten by one. So a good distance away and that big zoom enabled me just to zoom in and it looks like I was really close. And first day we got to the, the Galapagos, the weather was a bit rough. They put us in a Zodiac and they sent us off to the shore and said, go for a swim at the beach. And I remember we were in the shallows and we were getting smashed around, we were rolling upside down and falling over and you know, a bunch of adults <laughs> landing on their heads in the sea. 
because uh, it was really rough. And so they said, oh, maybe we should put you back on the boat. So the Zodiac came, we jumped on the Zodiac. And as we motored out of that really rough bay, I saw this blue-footed booby standing on these rocks and I started taking pictures. Now the boat, the Zodiac's rocking and my guide said, oh, no, don't, don't. Everyone else was taking photos too because they saw me doing it. They're like, oh, okay, let's get a picture. It's right there. Use the big zoom. And everyone, and the guide is like, no, 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 don't take photos of this. You'll see plenty of these. It's a waste of time. Too rough. And no, no, you'll see hundreds every day, everywhere. Don't even bother. And everyone else kind of felt a bit shamed by that. And they put their cameras down. And I just looked at him and said, yeah, no, sorry. I'm going to photograph it while it's here. Because why not? I could get a decent shot. It was right there. Well, that night, the reason that everything was so rough and choppy is a big storm was coming. It rolled in that night, basically blew the birds off the islands for the next few days, and we didn't see a single other blue-footed booby pretty much the whole time we were there. Very last day we did, but they were on the ground uh, nesting with lots of sticks around and they were doing this little nesting dance. Um, so that photo doesn't exist for anyone else. So don't ever let someone shame you into not shooting. If you want to take a shot and it's not, you know, it wasn't a time issue or it wasn't like a safety issue or you can't stand there, you can't do that, you're stressing something out. If it's the conditions and all those circumstances are good, get your shots and get as many as you want. Don't tell someone, you know, whether it's your guide or your photography leader or whoever, oh, no, stop shooting. We'll see that tomorrow. Tomorrow is never, ever granted uh, for anything, certainly not for the blue-footed boobies on the Galapagos. Went to the Amazon and, again, uh, that was on the back of the Galapagos trip to photograph wildlife. I had everything with me still from the Galapagos trip. Guess what I mostly used? The big zoom. Now, my expectations of the Amazon, I thought it would just be filled with animals, birds, insect, mammals, lots of subjects, really humid, and it would be very bright, you know, nice bright lights. The Amazon, you know, lots of, um, you know, glades where the trees are all around and light coming in. The actual reality was I found everything wet, damp, and dangerous. It was a pretty dangerous place, you know, the... Frogs can spit in your eye. There's tarantulas everywhere. There's trees that can stab you. Um, and it was very wet and dark. It was very dim in the jungle and the water surface was literally black. We flew in then we went on a motorized canoe for two hours. Then we went on a paddle canoe for two hours to get to our very remote kind of lodge. And the water was um, jet black. In the water, there were caiman alligators. Uh, there were great big freshwater otters, great big massive fish. One of them hit our kayak and one of our little kayaks and we tip someone in. There were piranhas. There were uh, fishing spiders, fight spiders so big that they don't have a web. They just jump in and grab a fish and jump out. Like, oh, my goodness, that's my worst nightmare. The backgrounds are very cluttered. There were lots of, lots of plants, lots of stuff, lots of vegetation. Birds and animals were really far away. Uh, on the way in, I remember we were being rained on. So we're literally all sitting on our being rowed on this boat that's, you know, we're inches from the water surface trying not to fall in on this little tiny wooden boat that they've carved out of a tree. And we're, like, sitting there and under a, a you know a raincoat because it was raining and everyone was a bit miserable. We've been on these things for about four hours. And they said, look up. I looked up and there was a fork of a tree with lots of leaves in it. And they said, that's a sloth. And I could only see leaves. Uh, so I think I saw a sloth. I'm not too sure. Um, a bit later on, on the way out of that trip, we did see a sloth. But again, far, far away, you know, like through this big three camera. Um, oh, there's a toucan. Far, far away. We're up on a big platform looking for birds. Um, still really cool to see. The canoes had poor stability. It, they were literally, um, they seated about eight people and they were dug out of like a big long tree and they had little like stools that little kids would sit on in school, sitting up on them that weren't bolted in and very, very unstable. And we had a guy that when he paddled, our canoe <laughs> rocked from side to side really badly. I spent most of my time just worried we were going to fall in because I do kayaking and I was like, if we fall in, only one of us is going to get back into this canoe because everyone else is going to keep falling out every time they try and get in. And there is no... We're on like a lake kind of thing and a river and then a lake. You know, there's no bank. It's just sludge and plants that if you grab them, they'll stab you in the hand. Like there was no actual edge where you could climb up onto grass or, you know, muddy bank or anything. It just was flooded forest. Uh, so I was pretty paranoid about that. And I mentioned tarantulas. Uh, got into my bed, pulled my mosquito net around me, and there was a tarantula in there with me. Uh, so I moved from that room because I was like, no, thank you. Then they said, oh, I'll come upstairs to the library tonight. We'll do a talk. Went up the stairs. On the ground, there's a tarantula, like just literally everywhere. And I love all creatures, but big hairy spiders, I cannot do. <laughs> so it was kind of traumatic for me in the uh, Amazon. So some days, because I was freaked out about the canoeing, <coughs> excuse me, and all the things going on, I just stayed around the hotel. So most of these photos was, were taken around the lodge. Didn't have any fences. It was a pretty wild place. But the ants, the cutter, ants were cutting the leaves, the leaf cutter ants, and making these little bits of leaf. 
and forming processions and you know carrying the leaf back to um, the anthills. Uh, this was a vulture just drying off after getting wet on a little sandbar. I think we took this from one of the motorized canoes. Uh, this, this is how far away the birds were. Like this is zoomed into the max distance of that lens at like 600 mil, um, at tiny, you know, tiny, way, way, way in the distance. Uh, railing, this is the railing outside my room and that blackness is kind of like that green color is kind of the water behind it. And really pretty butterfly just landed there. And I had the big zoom on, so I just stood far enough back and I was able to zoom in and get that shot. And these birds have, I think they have two stomachs, um, quite fascinating birds. But again, just outside my room on a stick, above some of the water. And then you can, see, you can see the blackness of the water there, a little butterfly uh, drinking the salty tears of the turtle. And he's even got a, some sort of fly thing on his back there as well. So that was my kind of lap around the, the actual uh, hotel accommodation. When I moved rooms from the tarantula room, the next room I had was closer to the water and I opened my suitcase and like hundreds of flying cockroaches flew out. So that was cockroach room, but I was fine with that because I don't mind cockroaches, but I wasn't going to do uh, share a bed with the trench room, my mosquito net. <laughs> I'm paranoid about mozzie nets now and spiders. And lastly, went to Africa to photograph wildlife. So some of these are from my first trip, some are from my second trip. Um, this trip I recently did, I took some of my Sony lenses with me because I had the Sony A1. Took these three, thinking, oh yeah, bit of everything. I might do some portraits with some, you know, landscape stuff. Might use the moderate zoom if things are fairly close, and I'll use the big zoom if stuff's far away. And as always, I mostly use the big zoom pretty much uh, every day. I don't even take the other two out of the bag. My expectations were animals are a long distance away. They're going to be far off on the savannah. I thought it might feel a bit unsafe, you know, riding around the Jeep with the roof open and windows down and lines right there. And I thought, um, I thought they're clean and tidy Jeep driving. I thought, you know, I'll be clean the whole time. The Jeep driving will be nice and smooth. It'll be all you know, nice and compact. And it's going to be, you know, pretty cool to shoot whether we're moving or we're not because, you know, how bumpy can it be? The reality was that animals are often very close. You can literally have a lion walking right underneath your car window, you know, and in that case, we would try not to even get in that position again because I'm always conscious of animal stress. Now, some lions don't care, some do. Um, I'd always make sure we just backed off or also we can't get shots. But first and foremost, you know, animal welfare, it was super dusty. Uh, as you can tell, I've coughed a few times. It was very, very dusty. Uh, that We ate dust the entire time. There's lots of grass in, in the way. The first time I went, the grass, it was earlier in the year and the grass hadn't grown so high. And this time there was quite a lot of grass. So a lot of animals were camouflaged in the grass and the animals were moving. The, this time when I went, we saw a lot of animal activity. You know, there were elephants fighting or shooing, you know, the mother elephant shooing the son out of the herd, telling him to go and join the bachelor herd. So kind of having a bit of a, a fight over it. We saw um, Thompson's gazelles play fighting, hippos biting each other you know, a cheetah chasing down a hare, lions feeding. We saw a lot of animal actual behaviour and activity. So driving into the Serengeti, uh, a lot of ostriches are a fair, fair far distance from the road, and this one was just standing right there, so I just wound the window down and took a picture. So, again, safety, I was in the safety of the car. You know, don't want to be standing out there with an ostrich. They'll pretty much kick you to death. And was able to just, and that's, just get a headshot by using that big zoom. Um, this is a fun photo. This is a photo that has done the rounds in our, our private tour groups for these trips. A lot of the people that went on the first Tanzania tour came on the second one. And this particular day, when you're shooting out there, you have to make choice all the time about what to, what to stop at and what not to stop at and when to go and when to stay. And as a tour leader, I make most of those choices for my vehicle and then the other vehicles usually follow. But it can be hard to get it right. Anyway, this particular day, my guide said, what do you want to see today? I said, well, let's go to where those lines were yesterday. And as we drove there, we saw... Um, some giraffe near a tree and I think there's an elephant there as well and he's like do you want to stop at that and I was like do you know what how spoiled to say this but I was like we got that we got we've got that all the other days let's go and see if we can get the lions because we've got those photos not of those ones but we've got we've seen a heap of elephants and giraffe you know that's how sport you are for animals out there that you're like oh just drive on so we drove on the minute we pulled up to this area the lion was sitting there like that the vehicle behind me from my tour saw the giraffe and elephant and said to their driver, no, stop. We want to get that photo. Stop, stop. And then he's like, but the other car's going to the line. And they're like, no, the line might not even be there. Let's just get this. So as we drove in, I got this shot. As they drove in a minute behind me, he 
plopped down in the grass and one of my friends just got a shot of empty grass and I always laugh saying, is this the shot that you missed? <laughs> um, and she was frustrated because it wasn't her idea to stop at the giraffe and the elephant. She's like, I want to keep going. You know, it's all about choice. Sometimes you, I won that one, but I could have well have lost it. The giraffe could have had a you know baby walk out from behind it and there was a baby there with it or something, you know, so it's all about choice. But um, again, this was one of the photos that pretty much none of us on tour got because I just happened to get really lucky as soon as we got there and snapped it. Uh, little elephant's baby with its mum on the plane. So you can see the grass there. Like normally I'm really fussy about pictures that have grass in front of faces. That little baby elephant's got two big strands of grass there. But this is how the, the how high the grass was this time around. Uh, giraffe just crossing the road outside the boundary of the Serengeti. So the Serengeti is not fenced. The parks in Tanzania are unfenced, unlike parks in South Africa. So animals are just roaming around. So we're just driving along the road, very bumpy dirt road. And about to head to the Serengeti gate, which is literally just a marker to say you're now in the Serengeti. And this giraffe just meandered past and just happened to look. Uh, again, big zoom out, out the window of the, the Jeep. Got a nice eyelash shot. And it enables me to do this with faces. So these pictures are all taken in camera like this. I have the concept in my mind before I shoot it. And I think I'm just going to do the lion's face. There's no whole head of this line or body shot with this line that I then crop this from. I would have those shots, but they're separate standalone pictures. I mentioned with the zebra earlier, doing the eye, the feet, the pattern, the whole zebra, this is the eye shot. And same with the elephant as well. And these are just from the recent trip the other week. And this photo got voted in my first tour, best photo of the tour. Now, these are rock dassies, also known as rock hyrax. They're pretty common in, across some parts of Africa. And they're probably the equivalent of not quite a rat, more like a squirrel. Like, you know, they're not really considered vermin, but people like them that live there, but they're everywhere and they're kind of common. Imagine if there's like heaps of guinea pigs running loose, probably kind of a bit like that. And they lived in the hotel, at these particular ones, in this rocky outcrop. They could just come and go. And they're pretty common. You see them kind of everywhere. So not as exciting or glamorous as a lion or an elephant or a hippo. And anyway, I'd been in the swimming pool, came out of the pool, walked past the rock hyrax mound of rocks, and I saw uh, one baby standing there. I thought, oh, I've got to get my camera, my big zoom, and sit back and take a picture of this only little, like, cute little baby. And then as I was sitting there, a second one popped out, then a third, then a fourth, then a fifth, and in the end I ended up with seven. And I got this shot. And the reason it was voted best shot of the trip is because when you're on tour, you're shooting side by side. So apart from the line in the grass photo, Literally every other photo I have, everyone else has as well. Very similar because we're all shooting from the same vehicles. We're side by side. And I love that. I love that we're all getting kind of the same content to the same quality. But this was the only only photo of these seven rock hyraxes that existed. And we actually stayed at this lodge again the other week. And, you know, dusk came along and I looked out the window and everyone was out there trying to get this picture. I managed to get a photo of four hyrax, but the picture of seven was gone. Uh, and now there's a big tree coming out of these rocks and a lot of it's like a willow tree and there were strands of tree in the way. So I couldn't even get a clear shot through all the stuff. And excuse the graphic nature of this photo. This is a dreadful photo, by the way. I just put it in to show you some context. Uh, we were following a female lioness. And again, it's all about choice. As she was walking along the road and I have, you know, know enough about animal behaviour, I felt like she was going somewhere. As we are driving along, the other Jeeps that were there said, oh, there's a male lion back here. Do you guys want to come back? And my driver looked at me and I said, no, let's follow her. She kept jogging and she wasn't jogging because of anything we did. She just kept running and stopping. I said, I think she's going to cubs maybe. Anyway, so everyone else stayed with the male lion that popped up out of the grass. And we'd seen a fair few male lions, but we I wanted to know where she was going. And she ran along for another probably mile with the only car there. And all of a sudden she cut to the left and I looked down off the top of the Jeep and there were 18 lions feeding off this carcass right there, and that's where she went. So we had that to ourselves uh, for about 20 minutes before the other vehicles eventually joined us. And so they're feeding on a water buffalo. Now, these there were 18 lions in this vicinity, and you can see there's cubs on top. There were 10 cubs out of the 18. There's a big adult lion to the left that you can't see. And the two inside, little cubs inside, they crawled inside the carcass. All right. Now, this is a pretty gross photo, but I had a big zoom. So I got to the front of the Jeep. We're up high. Lots of grass in the way you can see there, but I was able to zoom in and just isolate those cubs feeding from the inside of that carcass, which for animal behavior is quite fascinating. I was actually worried one of the lines from the outside was going to munch them because they're in there and everyone's eating it and pulling it apart. Um, this for a sort of Nat Geo kind of type shot, it's one of those once in a lifetime pictures for me. It's disgusting. I don't want to put it on the wall of my house by any means, but to see that as a behavior and the cub on the bottom is so full 
and I'm tired. He's barely like mouth still open while he's eating. He's like, oh, really sleepy. Um, just fascinating and really, really cool to see. And again, I made the right call. You win some, you lose some. That one, we definitely won that. The male line, we had male line shots. Um, and in the end, that male line got up and walked and joined this group uh, of feeding lines. So what does it all mean? Take your biggest lens if you're shooting wildlife. Take all your lenses by all means because then other things might pop up. But if you're working with wildlife, always try and take a decent size zoom. That um, I guess I'm getting to the point now where, all right, I will just take my zoom. Let's see how that goes for my next trip because I'm barely using the other ones anyway. I do use them for other things, you know, locally, but not on, when I'm on tour and photographing wildlife. And as far as the realities go, you need to adapt to them and have that flexibility. You can have an expectation, but it's always going to change. And you just have to go with whatever those animals are giving you. Try and pre-select your gear as best you can, but know that you're going to get a few surprises and just have a good time. You know, photography is one of the, if not the greatest hobby in the world. You know, we get to show people how we see things and view the world through our images and we get feedback on them and we get to go to cool places. And, you know, I'll even go into my backyard and photograph birds. You know, if there's no, you know, um, exotic animal around, I'll just photograph a seagull. I don't care. Any creature will, you know, be the focus of my lens. Just a few little extras. Thank you so much for your time on that. I'm um, trying to get through everything so you're not up for hours and hours. A few little extras. I have a little private group for my photo breaks, so all my tours get promoted in here. Uh, next year I've got a tour to Laos, working at the Bear, Bear Rescue Sanctuary. Not the one I showed you, a very um, lovely one. There's two animal rescue centres in Laos that the Bear Rescue people run. One's not open to the public. We get to go there. And we also do some rescue elephant work as well, up close and personal with elephants going through a jungle walk. So um, this is where I post all the information on my tours. So if anyone would like to join, you're more than welcome. It's called Down to Earth Photo Breaks on Facebook. Uh, I also have, anyone's interested in the business side of photography, I have a private group called Inspire with Alex Kearns. Uh, and if you forget this stuff, please just drop me an email and I can um, basically send you the links to, just to sign up. So that's another Facebook group. And finally, I do coaching for people who are either existing photographers who'd like to do pet photography or struggling pet photographers who'd like more business and have a better business structure. So I have a seven-week one-on-one program for that. Uh, it's called the Business Acceleration Program for Pet Photographers. My next intake is October, and I think I have about two places left at the moment for that. And that's my probably my last one for this year. Next one will be January. So I also post details of the courses in this Inspire group as well. So if anyone is keen to know a little bit more, please jump in there. Um, here's how you can find me. Excuse that random eye there on its own on the left. Uh, if you do need to email me to find out what those pages are or you have any other questions, I'm going to jump into the chat now and read out a few. Please um, keep in touch or any questions about lenses as well. I'm always open to asking about those. On that, I only use products and endorse products. Well, I only endorse products I use. I only use products that do the job for me. You know, I'm not going to use something that doesn't work for me and I'm not going to use something that I am asked to put my name to just for the sake of it. These uh, Tamron lenses have done the job for me for over 10 years. I uh, literally haven't touched another brand of lens since I first put a Tamron lens on my camera. So thank you. I'm just going to uh, stop the share for one sec and jump into the chat, or I might even be able to do it with the share on. Okay, here we go. And run through a few questions. So a couple of sent, uh, questions were sent in before we started. I just... Um, you can see them here on the screen. Um, does lower f-stop at 300 mil soften your subject? If you're focused on the animal's eye, would their body be soft at 2.8? You'll notice from the style of photographs I take at 2.8, which is mostly what I'll try and use if the lens goes down to that, some are f5 um, to 6.3 as you zoom. Mostly those big zooms are f5 to 6.3. Um, I'm aiming for a sharp eye or whatever I'm focusing on, I want sharp. I don't mind if the rest falls away. Um, I find it's easy to get a sharp shot of the eye and the rest of the body kind of focus blends out, but you can still see what it is than trying to get the whole animal in focus by increasing that F-stop. And it, you know, even just you breathing might then, you know, make them out of focus. So I kind of like the look of that. Uh, you'll notice too that even though I shoot studio and wildlife and they're very different, my wildlife shots generally, apart from the lion cubs in the carcass, have a very um, kind of block even kind of background to them. It's either just grass or it's environment or, you know, very, very kind of plain stuff. Um, so I, it is kind of similar to my studio sh to my studio images that have black or white backgrounds in that when I'm shooting outdoors, even though the focus is very different with the wildlife stuff, you know, it's kind of blurs out. Uh, the background's very clear. Um, for those of us with modest means, 
who can't afford a Nikon Z9, which camera bodies can you recommend? I think the best thing to do is contact the team at Adorama and tell them what your budget is and what you're shooting. And then they can best match a camera to your budget. It's really hard to recommend cameras without knowing what people's budgets are. And there are a lot of options. Think about whether you want a DSLR or a, you know, um, a mirrorless camera. Think about what sort of lens you might want. Do you want multiple lenses? Do you want one lens that does everything? And I'll be able to help you out. For Antarctic, do you recommend gloves or mittens? Uh, like I said, uh, don't wear wool, wear gloves that are waterproof. Any recommendations? I thought my batteries would drain really quickly. I didn't have any problem with batteries at all. Maybe we just weren't out on the ice for long enough. We're out there for four or five hours some days on, on the, the continent off the boat. Um, didn't have any problem at all. I took too many warm clothes. So, you know, one set of warm clothes, you know, um, thermals and stuff, but I, I didn't even end up wearing thermals. To be honest, sometimes I was on the, the land in a T-shirt. Mind you, I was the only one in a T-shirt, so that might have been me. Um, can you talk about the difference in photographing movement versus portraiture? Yeah, basically... I go for portraiture because that's what I'm after. I don't always go for the action. I got a little bit of action stuff in Africa this trip, but I mostly go for portraiture. It's just about making sure your camera's fast enough if they're moving to freeze the motion. So you have to increase your shutter speed and make sure that it's a lot faster. Um, helpful camera settings for stationary and moving wildlife. Do you use tracking? I didn't used to use tracking until I started using the Sony A1 and I use the animal eye tracking feature and you have to have tracking turned on to do that. And it's exceptional. It is very hard to get a blurry photo uh, using that. So yes, I do use tracking. Normally, uh, without so on the Canon, it doesn't have the animal eye tracking. I just normally, you know, focus myself because again, I'm going for portraits too. I'm not really going for action. Um, how do you determine depth of field with the digital lens and the older lenses that's engraved? When you put the lens on the camera, the camera body shows you what your depth of field is, what you're set at, and you can increase it or decrease it based on that. So that comes up on your display screen. And most of the lenses too have written on them um, what the range is. So like the zoom range, like f5 to 6.3 or f2.8 all the way through, that is written on the little statistics area of the lens um, around the barrel. Best places for wildlife photography, including what you can find locally around town you know, instead of traveling too far. I, I photograph any creatures. I'm not fussy. So best places are places where there are creatures. You know, in this presentation, I have some pretty awesome locations. Um, some I might go back to, some I'll probably never go to again. You know, um, it's pretty arduous getting to the Antarctic. I don't know if I want to go through that boat trip again. But I don't have to go to the Antarctic to get a great shot. You know, that that raven on the beach in Sri Lanka, just in the city of Colombo, which is, you know, just a big city. Um, I'll be happy with that. Um, how to set your camera to be ready for any shot? I think you, if you change your settings for one shot, always reset them back to square one so you know that you're starting from an even point. I put my focus point in the center. So I always know that when I pick up that camera, I can just point it at the subject in the middle and I make sure I've got it on burst mode so that I can do a, a rapid series of photos any one time. And I always make sure my F stops the lowest. Do you have any special tips for photographing animals in a zoo? Yes, I've heard San Diego Zoo is very good. Thanks, Vincent. Um, again, just working with what you've got, you know, like I showed with the, the bears in the Vietnam sanctuary and Cambodia sanctuary, working through the bars, um, you know, high vantage points if you can, low vantage points shooting up. I When I photograph at the zoo, I try and eliminate, generally, not in that sanctuary because it's a little bit hard, but generally I'll try and eliminate zoo stuff, like fences in the background and things like that. I try and make it look kind of like um, it's uh, there's a little bit more freedom and space. So just working with the environment. And sometimes, too, it's about knowing when there are no shots. You might be like, okay, I really want to photograph this monkey, but there's just too much stuff and the, the light's dappled or it's just not a good time of day to shoot. You can come back later and try again. Um, what's the scariest moment you've had? Probably a tarantula in my mosquito net, which is pretty mild. I mean, it wasn't going to do anything to me. Um, I have had some pretty close calls with a few animals. Uh, I'm working on another presentation called, you know, the 15 times I almost really kind of nearly, not really died, <laughs> um, but I've nearly been off by everything from a bear to a tiger to a hedgehog to a grasshopper that could could have eaten my eye, all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, working with animals, there's always a story. What focal length lenses are the best to pack? For me, the one with the biggest zoom, especially when I'm going on safari. What advice would you give someone who wants to go from photography being a hobby to more of a second career and early retirement? Um, I think find someone that can help you get there. You know, I wish there were business coaches around when I started because it could have saved me about 10 years of mistake making. So if you want to do it seriously as a career and you take photos that are good enough for people to pay money for, uh, find someone that can get you from A to B super quick. Invest in yourself. 
and that will help you get there and build you, you know, someone that can build you a business system or build you what you need to run your clients through and give you all the strategies to bring people in. Um, best focus settings for birds in flight. Um, for birds in flight, I do sometimes increase my ISO to about F8 because if I want the beak and the wing tip in focus, and again, just making a camera super fast. So you want a fast shutter speed to freeze the motion. And I think birds in flight, one of the hardest genres to photograph, other than maybe rock band photography where the light's always changing and it's dim and people are moving, you know, band band and concert photography is pretty hard too. Birds in flight's pretty much up there. Uh, and also a fast lens, you know, a good fast lens on a good fast camera body. Um, and what are your thoughts about a micro four thirds camera system for wildlife photography? You use whatever suits you best. I don't really have any opinion on gear. I'm not a gear snob. You just got to use what works best for you. And if that's something that you can get the shots you want with, then use that. Um, and with wildlife in particular, it's really hard for me not to be uh, way too hard on myself. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, I'm like, oh, this none of, like none of these pictures do I think are even good enough for the public eye. But I know that I have to at some point show people photos, so you know we can pick stuff apart. But also, it's not even about perfection. It's about sharing that experience and sharing that moment as well. So we have to ease up on ourselves a little bit about that. Um, and that's the end of the question. So I'm going to click out of here if I can. Minimize that and stop my screen share. And thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. As I said, any questions, um, feel free to send them through uh, to me and um, hope you enjoy whatever the rest of you are doing on World Photography Day. Thank you so much.